Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, running you through a couple of my uh, projects within the realm of um, publishing, independent publishing, and also an institutional project um, that I founded in 2020. Um, I'll try to speak loud enough. If you cannot hear me, then just shout at me. Um, yes, so I'll start from the beginning. Um, I started my first blog when I was eight years old, um, back in 2008-2009, um, which was the golden age of the blog. This was essentially the medium before Instagram, before social media, where um, young people could um, reach out with their creative expressions. Um, for me, it was a really um, a liberating space um, to be able to um, create a lot of um, photos, texts, various kinds of productions, and also be able to show it to the world um, from my childhood basement room in the suburbs of Oslo in Norway. Um, and the, the the blog was, um, you know, a kind of it was kind of run by this little micro. Uh, editorial team. I um, was able to. Um, I mean, first of all, it was in 2008. It began as a as a blog speaking about who I'd been playing with at school or um, what I had eaten in my lunchbox, and then it slowly turned to be more of a fashion sort of cultural um, space. And then in 2000 and 12, I would say, I got onto Instagram and I started connecting with a lot of like-minded people um, there and together with five other um, young Scandinavian bloggers, um, I founded Archetype, which was a blog network that um, we put together for young people to essentially have an umbrella where we could have run our blogs together, we could um, have this, this kind of... Um, small uh, internet magazine, we would produce um, all kinds of content. I don't have any photos from that time because, as you know, uh, archiving the digital can be quite hard. I've had a, co a couple of computers since 2008 that have crashed, so I don't have any, um, any footage from the time. And also the website was taken down because we didn't pay the digital rent. Um, but. I was doing Archetype together with these fellow young bloggers um, for a year and a half um, before I started getting very fascinated with the, um, the printed medium. And that was just by me going to the newsstands and using my weekly allowance to, um, to buy a lot of fashion magazines, um, photography magazines, and I was really, really intrigued, you know, having grown up um, with the digital medium being as natural as my right arm, it was really amazing to have something that I could put all my attention into, um, which was in paper, it was printed, um, it was a physical artifact, it, was, it smelled good, it had this, this beautiful sensation um, just flipping through it. So um, I also thought that the printed medium was maybe the, the, you know, the, the kind of top shelf medium um, out of all the, the, the spaces in which I could produce content. So um, that's when I got the idea of turning Archetype into a magazine that would be printed and would be in the newsstands. For me, that was the most kind of bold thing that could, that could um, happen. So that is the beginning of Reason's paper, which you see behind me now. Um, the first issue came out in 2013 and um, I mean, I didn't have any experience running a magazine, so um, we, we basically did the layout in a Word document, um, which turned out quite pixelated when we printed 1,000 copies. Uh, there was a lot of grammar mistakes. We wanted to do it in English. Um, we had a, a pretty international ambition, but you know, English is not our mother tongue, was not my mother tongue, so there was a lot of grammar mistakes and so on. But for me, it was just about doing it, and um, I, ha I don't have a photo of the first, the first um, issue of Reasons behind here, but I do have 950 copies in my dad's garage in Norway, in case you guys <coughs> want them. Um, 
For the second issue, um, I started working with a graphic designer called Morteza Vesegi, who Alec also very well knows. Um, and we wanted to start kind of professional, professionalizing the magazine quite a bit. Um, the, it was very important that Reasons was run by and for young people. So we had, uh, we opened this submission page online where all kinds of creatives below the age of roughly 30, 25, 30, um, could submit their work, whether it was poetry, photography, um, illustrations, essays, interviews, and so on. So we started gathering a lot of materials, and uh, we also saw that we had a lot of international submissions, which we were very happy to, um, to include. So um, my work as kind of editor-in-chief um, started becoming more of a curatorial work, selecting um, materials that we wanted to feature, putting it in context, and then working with Morteza on the layout and kind of um, yeah, creating a, a, an exciting packaging around the material that we had. So this issue was, fund, we, um, was financed through a Kickstarter, so a fundraiser. We didn't have any advertisers at the time. Um, I also used my, I don't know if you have that here, confirmation, like uh, when you're like 13, it's like a, it's like a, bar, like a bar mitzvah kind of. Um, anyway, we have that and, and that's a like a celebration where you receive monetary gifts from your family. So I spent all of that also into the, f the second issue of Reasons. So um, that's the first one to the top, uh, top left over there. Um, and with, with, the with the second issue of Reasons, we also got an international distributor. So suddenly these, uh, these copies ended up in a lot of bookstores and newsstands and museum stores and so on around the world. Um, and I do believe we were printing about 1,500. So still quite a small and limited run, but um, it all sold out. So that was very exciting. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's, um, you know, we, we published seven issues in total of, of reasons. Um, it was a very exciting project. We just had our 10th anniversary and I was going through a lot of the content that we produced. Um, I think also as creatives, we tend to look forward and maybe not look so much backwards. So it was nice to be able to reminisce and, and look at some of the, the stuff that we, that we published. Um, from the third issue, we also started working with advertisers and I cannot zoom, but um, you can see it on the screen. We, ha we created, we decided to create um, this ad warning border because we had a lot of young people, um, or mostly young people, reading our magazine and we wanted to make it very clear that this was paid um, content. So we created this five centimeter wide um, border where it essentially stood, it, it just said ad warning, ad warning, ad warning. And a lot of the <clears throat> advertisers would get quite angry when we um, launched this concept or this graphic element. But what they didn't understand is that when we sold them the ads, we had just sold them the inside pages of the border. So legally they couldn't really do anything. And also we said, we also argued that uh, this, is, this is what the young people want. And as we know, these big brands, they want to appeal to a younger audience. So they kind of went with it. Um, yes, so after this, or on the seventh issue of Recents, um, I had just turned um, 18 years old and I felt that this magazine was so genuinely by and for young people and running a youth culture magazine when I was essentially an adult would be like running a student magazine as a teacher. So I decided to resign from Reasons paper um, after the seventh issue in the fall of 2017, um, which was always kind of a conscious decision. And I think um, we can also we will also get back to it with the second publishing venture that I did. But to to end a magazine is just as important as the moment when you begin a magazine. I think and and this kind of idea of duration is also something that I've been um, playing a lot with with uh, with my publishing projects. 
And we'll also uh, open for some questions at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, there will be a chance to ask them. Um, yeah, so with Reasons, um, Reasons was not a kind of a, a fashion magazine. It was a youth culture magazine, but fashion was a big part of it. We did run a lot of fashion editorials and we did interview um, a lot of fashion figures, uh, young fashion designers and so on. And through understanding the fashion industry and kind of getting, having a one foot in, one foot out perspective, um, there was a lot of things that I was completely disagreeing um, with and a lot of people I felt very intimidated by, a lot of powerful people in the industry that I was really intimidated by. Um, so I wanted the second, my second publishing project to be about the kind of institutional side of fashion. I didn't want to necessarily speak so much about material production or fashion design in this project. I wanted to look at the ecosystem that makes up the fashion industry that is supporting the design and supporting um, material uh, production. So um, the first issue of Wallet was uh, called Admins of Authority and was uh, about the big power players in the industry. We interviewed, I interviewed three um, uh, kind of, well, three people with very uh, important and powerful positions in fashion. Um, one of them is the CEO of Comme des Garçons, the fashion house, and also Dover Street Market, the, the retail concept, um, Adrian Joff. Um, I also interviewed Sarah Andelman, who was the buyer and the founder of uh, the co-founder co of Colette, the retail store that was in Paris. I think it closed in 2018. I think it closed the, the same year that we published the first issue of Wallet. Um, and the third kind of power personality I interviewed was Jefferson Hack, who's the, um, the publisher and co-founder of Dazed Media. So for me, those three people represented um, positions in the industry that had to do with what we as consumers are exposed to. Um, the buyer through curating, you know, the, the shop windows or um, the selection of what is in and what is out. So this, this idea of inclusion and exclusion, um, the same with the CEO and the same with um, the publisher also deciding and selecting what we're exposed to in the magazines. Um, so that was the first, first issue of Wallet. Um, the second issue was about the, the sort of fashion publishing scene, which was um, where we also interviewed three uh, publishers, but also did, um, so the, the magazine, and I'll show you a, in a bit with this little device here, um, but half of the magazine was sort of a, a text conversation. We decided to call it a text conversation with the three interviews each time, and uh, the other half was a visual conversation. So we invited, um, 20 sort of practitioners in the field of fashion to uh, interpret the, the respective theme of the issue. The third issue was about education in fashion. The fourth was about creative spaces in fashion. So that means um, the studio spaces, the exhibition spaces um, and so on. The fifth issue was about retail spaces, which was also quite interesting, both m b mixing physical and, and e-commerce um, stores. We did an issue on the bodies in fashion, so essentially the modeling industry and casting, which was a very hard issue to do. And as you can imagine, it's a very gate kept uh, part of the industry and they didn't really want, I mean, the agents didn't want to speak, but the models were kind of not allowed to speak um, and so on. We did a marketing issue. We did a technology issue. Um, we did an issue on criticism. And finally, we did an issue on fashion archiving. Um, so yeah, maybe we should try to get this on doc cam. And we zoom out. Yes. So um, <clears throat> when we had published 10, 10 issues, we really wanted to uh, create a little box set kind of compiling all of the issues that we had done. Uh, so we did a reprint of all of the 10 issues. And then we um, basically reached out to, uh, to Gucci and because they had been uh, advertising with us for many of our issues. And 
we asked them if they could finance this project. So we printed, um, we made 175 of these box sets. Uh, this is the only one I have left and you see it's quite worn out. It's been in my bag. Looks like it's been in the mud. Okay, let's see. I thought maybe this is an easier thing to do than to pass it around, but we can also put it here for, the, um, for you to have a look at it after. The lecture, um, here too we had, so for example here we had Chanel paying about 5,000 uh, euros for an ad, but we wanted to apply the same kind of humor and the same kind of um, critical graphic design element to wallet as well. So we always printed our ads with the perforation so the ads could be torn out. So you could throw away the ads or you could put them up on your bedroom wall, which is certainly what we told the advertisers. <laughs> so we had, um, yeah. And then on the back we had always a Gucci ad, which cannot be torn out, but we should have found a, a fun way to work around that as well. That will be for next time. So here are the kind of the textual, com the text conversations that we did. And then we always did these visual conversations. So in this one, there's, the topic of um, authority or um, power that was interpreted. So a lot of really exciting um, visual um, expressions. We always had two pages of um, notes or uh, basically like line pages of two spreads of, of notes. So the idea was basically that it was possible to bring wallet around. I mean, the format is quite small. It could fit in your back, in your back pocket. Um, we wanted to see if people would bring them around. This was also in a time where sort of very large coffee table um, books and magazines were adapting to this coffee table book format. So it was quite inconvenient, quite heavy. Um, yes, and also in 2018, it was also this kind of predicted print death, which we always kind of ignored. I mean, it, it was also very present in the, with the recent project as well, that young people, you know, wouldn't want to buy anything printed or read anything um, printed. So yeah, you could kind of take notes from it and take notes in it. Um, So here we had the, again, the perforated ad. Barney's never paid for this. They went bankrupt. It's quite funny. So that one should be thrown out of the issue. Um, yeah, where does fashion happen? This was the creative space issue. So we had exhibition spaces. We had this beautiful um, archival image from the Florence Fashion Biennale, um, Fondazione Prada. This is Kenneth Isay, a Nigerian fashion designer studio. It's really beautiful. The Hussein Chalayan um, runway set. Yeah, you name it. I also wanted to quickly show you the visual conversation of the, the body issue, which I think was quite, you know, there was something quite absurd about just printing the comp card. So the essentially a model's business card or portfolio on these pages and to me it just it just says a lot about how we deal with the bodies that wear the clothes in in the fashion industry so lastly we did the the heirs of history so that was the art the fashion archive issue again the ads you know now we started to publish ads at the beginning of the magazine, a little bit more expensive. Um, so this was the final issue. Um, so this was both archival material and um, yeah. So when we did that, um, let's see. The fashion archive issue kind of alluded to the next project that I was already getting started with, um, which is the International Library of Fashion Research. Um, 
That project started with this gentleman in the red cap over there, um, a guy called Stephen Mark Klein, who was based in uh, New York. He was a cultural theorist, um, and he was about 65 years old, I think. Um, he did um, a fashion criticism kind of troll kind of, uh, yeah, fashion criticism site that was called Not Vogue. I'm not sure if anyone has heard about it, um, but he used to do the his his the merch of Not Vogue was uh, these T-shirts where it said, you know, um, fuck Dazed, fuck Gucci. It was like um, really just banal fashion criticism um, that he would do. Um, and in 2015, he sent me an email saying, uh, "Who are you?" which was very strange and it was this weird email address. It was smk at, you know, something something. And I thought this was a robot who had written to me. Um, but I had a principle and I still have the principle of answering every email that I receive. So this was no exception. Um, I answered to him and I said, you know, well, my name is Elise by Olson. I run this magazine called Reese's Paper, which is what I did at the time. Um, and I wrote a couple of paragraphs about my work. And uh, the day after I received a, f um, a response, an email back saying, LOL, I know very well who you are. So I thought, who, this is very, you know, very, very strange. And following that, um, this weird email address, which was exactly what it was at the time, started sending me a lot of links and a lot of this kind of, I would say it was kind of a fashion industry matrix. He started mapping out the industry for me, you know. Uh, this is the person in charge of that. You need to know this person. This is how you do uh, distribute your, your magazine and this in this country. He was really kind of starting to teach me um, and mentor me, kind of uh, whether I liked it or not. It was just, he was sending me daily emails with links and, uh, and information. And it was also a lot of gossip, a lot of daily mail stuff and you know, this fashion designer married this person and so on. So a lot of kind of useless stuff um, also. And um, around the time that I founded Wallet, I wanted to interview him about his criticism practice. And we started, from there we started speaking on the phone daily. And in 2018, 19, he asked me if I wanted to inherit um, his collection of fashion printed matter that he had been collecting since 1975. Um, and I didn't really know, you know what to do with the, all this kind of material. I didn't know exactly what kind of collection uh, we were talking about. So I traveled um, to New York and came to his one bedroom apartment in uh, the Lower East Side and we started going through all of the materials that he had and we started making an Excel sheet, kind of registering every single object. And uh, of course, you know, that was, we just reached the tip of the iceberg. There was so much material that he had. His apartment had a bed and a stationary Mac from 2001. So a desk and a little couch and that was it. He was living in this um, printed matter and that would be books, magazines, um, but also invitations, commercial catalogs, brochures, um, business cards, anything printed really. Um, and he wasn't a particularly wealthy man, but he had a big interest for this kind of printed matter. So he would do his weekly rounds and go around to all of the fashion stores and take the catalogs that would, you know, typically be on the, on the store counter. Um, and that's how he, he built a collection. So I said, I eventually said, yes, I would love to inherit this collection. Um, it's a big honor, but also a big responsibility as everyone who collects knows, there's always the issue about space. So um, kind of simultaneously while discussing what to do with this collection, um, I was in touch with the National Museum in Norway and they um, had just initiated a new focus on um, contemporary fashion. So Stephen and I wrote a letter where it said, um, to whom it may concern at the National Museum of Norway, we want, we, uh, we want to found 
a fashion library. So it was very naive. It was um, kind of ridiculous when I think back at it now, but it worked. So the National Museum said, we would love to house this collection. We don't know where and how and what we're going to do, but um, we will help you pack it up and ship it from New York and to the harbor of Oslo. So in June 2020, right in the middle of COVID, I received, well, I was on the harbor, I was on the dock of Oslo, and I saw this big container being, you know, transported off the, the ship because it was traveling to Oslo by boat. Um, and as it kind of smashed onto the dock in Oslo, I, I thought, what the fuck have I done? You know, this is the biggest, you know, this is a, this is a lifelong project. I cannot, this is not reasons or wallet where I can only do 10 issues or seven issues and wrap it up. I mean, this is very permanent. Um, so 5,000 objects um, came to Oslo and um, I was very determined that this was a, a collection that I wanted to make accessible to other people and not just something that I was going to use for my own personal research. So I wanted it to be a library and I wanted it to be open and free and accessible. And I thought that the National Museum could help me with that also in terms of funding and so on. So I reached out to a local high school that I had also been attending a couple of years before that, which was a media high school. And I um, got a 20, 16 year old um, students to help me register every single object in Stevens collection and we created a digital database which is essentially a website where um, anyone can have access to um, the objects and see what we have in the collection what kind of scope we have in the collection but it would also be a little editorial platform and um, something that would kind of be in sync with uh, an eventual physical um, offer. So at this point we hadn't still open because it was COVID times and we couldn't, um, yeah, we couldn't have people in the space yet. So this website is, is open for everyone. And for those of you who will join the workshop tomorrow, we'll have a little digital archive visit. Um, Yes, so while we were working on registering and getting all of these documents into the website, we also started receiving a lot of uh, offers from private collectors, fashion houses and publishers who wanted to essentially donate to our collection. So um, the, the collection started growing really quickly um, and we understood that we need to build a space that can have a kind of... Um, longevity and that can that can house this collection as it grows uh, but we also understood that this is not just going to be a storage space for the past and for archival objects but also that this is going to be something that can be actively used in order to create a desired fashion industry or a desired world to be really fluffy um, so what you see behind here is a study space that we created um, and the idea with the study space was that anyone could come in um, from a fashion design student to a business student to a business you know, executive, say the Gucci CEO, um, or even a retired person or a kind of a broader audience, and that people would start talking. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's, I mean, I've just been in Manchester for about 24 hours, so I don't know if I can compare Manchester and Oslo, but what I will say is that it's really exciting doing this project in a city that is not a big metropolitan fashion city. And that was also something that I thought was very important, that this project should not be housed in London or New York or Paris or Tokyo. This should be a little bit off the map. Um, it is very important in order to remain a bit more neutral. I mean, the Norwegian fashion scene is very, very small. Um, and I thought that this kind of study space and this kind of initiative could really help create a milieu and um, a little community uh, for fashion thinkers, um, fashion criticism, um, and so on. So 
um, a part of making this collection come to life and being active is to do mediational projects. So we have a bit of a program, um, a, an ongoing program that is that contains of educational projects, um, publishing projects, curatorial projects, so smaller exhibitions that we do. Um, I don't know if any one of you guys went to the Bound Book Fair that was here in Manchester, but we did a satellite project um, here for that, uh, which was uh, a selection of our collection. And it's also really interesting because this is an international project, so it can travel. We can have a physical space in Oslo that is um, open and accessible, and that is really our kind of headquarters, but it can also be mobile and, into, and yeah, we can create different interventions with it. Um, yes, so we do also a publishing uh, series, which is the little tome stones that you see behind, behind us here. I didn't bring copies of that, but I will ship it um, so you can have a look or you can come to Oslo. We also do a fashion research symposium, which we have done um, for two years. So once a year we do a kind of a two day conference for that is both kind of theoretical, but also practical. Um, the fashion research symposium is not just for um, academic research, but also practical research, which is very important for us. Um, this is some of the exhibition projects that we have done. Yes, and I wanted to also just talk a little bit about how the, the library is organized. Um, this is a little bit, it pertains uh, or it relates a little bit to the projects that I've previously done with Wallet and Reasons being kind of organizational projects where I look at myself as a kind of facilitator um, and then inviting in a lot of people to, um, to be in dialogue with the projects. So here behind us is the International Library of Fashion Research's advisory board, which we have put together in order to steer both the collection and make sure there is a width and a breadth in the collection that is necessary, but also in terms of um, the activities surrounding the collection. Um, because of course it cannot just be me deciding what should be included and what should be, should be excluded in, um, in the collection. And um, today I think we have about 15,000 objects in the collection. Um, anyone can come inside, there's no need to put gloves. Um, everyone can use it. It's really meant to be a library and not an archive. Um, that's very important for us. Um, yes, so I think maybe that's a little quick run through of um, my practice from 2013, well actually before that until presently. Um, yeah, I was, I was just before this lecture I visited the special collections um, and the reading room on the other side of the campus which was also great to see and I think Part of what we do with the library in Oslo is to focus on um, ephemera and the printed matter that surrounds fashion um, and also looking at that in parallel to the, the culture of producing and creating artist books. So for me, it was really exciting to see that. And, um, and I'm also really amazed by the fact that there are so many um, students here at the, at the Fashion Institute in Manchester, which also really proves that Fashion happens anywhere and um, and can be decentralized. And I think we we noticed a big shift also during the the pandemic with um, where stuff can happen so and exciting stuff and all these intellectual ecosystems around fashion pops up um, anywhere. I think that's maybe what I have. And if there's any questions, I would be very happy to answer answer them. So Stephen passed away in 2021, uh, in October 2021. Um, he got quite ill after uh, he um, donated or uh, kind of uh, separated himself from the collection. Um, so he passed away before 
uh, the, li the physical library in Oslo opened, which was uh, very sad, but also, you know, yeah, it's also kind of a beautiful thing that he kind of passed on the baton and now this project is really coming to life and, you know, he's still very present, of course, in the, in the project and in the collection and, um, yeah. Well, I think that the library is a very permanent uh, uh, project um, and it's definitely, you know, a lot more long term than I kind of first thought it would be. Um, but I'm also really open to, um, you know, maybe leaving the project for a bit or letting someone else in and having a take on it while still kind of, uh, yeah still having something to do with it but I think projects change all like all the time I'm uh, currently 24 years old there's so many other things and so many other directions I want to explore but the good thing is that all of that can also happen as part of this institutional project so in a way I also look at it as kind of an umbrella and um, whatever directions you know it can take I, I think I'm very open to that um, and I also have a lot of very great collaborators um, on the library project. Um, it's, it's quite a cross-generational team, which is very exciting as well. Um, from me, who's kind of the youngest, and a couple of other researchers that we currently have in the space um, through this Erasmus pro uh, program. Um, to Murteza Vasegi, who is the graphic designer that I started working with in yeah, 10 years ago, who's still doing the design and, and um, is very much still involved in the library, to Elsa, who is maybe 55 years old, and she was the former um, uh, press attaché, so the communications officer at Margiela in the 80s, so she was Martin Margiela's right hand, um, and who I actually uh, met through doing this issue of Wallet, which was the marketing issue. And I interviewed Patrick Scallon, who's um, an Irish uh, communications, uh, well, he's actually a speechwriter uh, by training, but he um, took over Elsa's job at Margiela in the early 90s. And he said, when I interview, interviewed him for the seventh issue of Wallet, I was, I was getting started thinking about what I could do with the library. And he said, you have to meet this woman, Elsa. She's a farmer, but she's a farmer in just in the south of Oslo. Um, but she has this background in fashion. And, you know, I said, because there's this, this kind of, um, what should I say? Like, th there's maybe not as much confidence in the Norwegian fashion industry. And for me, I was just returning back during COVID to be with my family. I was having a, quite an international practice and I didn't know what was happening in the kind of Oslo um, scene. So I said very arrogantly to Patrick, I said, no, this, she cannot be Norwegian. She has, she has to be Swedish or Danish or something. You, mu you must be wrong. Um, but I, I understood that she was indeed a, an organic farmer living in Norway and she had kind of left the industry because she, there was also a lot of things that she wasn't agreeing to. And I think that's also where we kind of connected, that we were quite critical and quite frustrated with the present scene. But this project has allowed us to, to look backwards without being maybe nostalgic and rather being kind of proactive and, yeah, looking outwards and zooming out. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I would say that the Oslo fashion scene is quite small, but we also have 
Um, I mean, you know, but we have the National Academy of the Arts who educate maybe 10 fashion design students or uh, 10 fashion design students graduate every year. Um, but then we also have a couple of private schools that deal more with the commercial industry. So what I find in Oslo is that the scene is quite split between the people working quite with, with kind of commercial fashion and the bigger uh, brands or even like, you know, a lot of sportswear and techwear and Helly Hansen and whatnot. And on the other side, you have like the niche more, how do you say, like intellectual or more kind of um, discursive side of the industry. And I find that there's no bridge between the two sides, you know, which is very unfortunate when there's such, it's such a small city. So I think part of this library is also trying to kind of be open to create these links between the two sides and more conversation, because that's the only way to kind of move forward, I believe. Um, in terms of working internationally, um, I think, I mean, the internet, I think social media, um, that's also something that even though all of the publishing projects that I've done are physical and in print, I've always embraced um, the digital possibilities and the digital tools, um, whether that is reaching out and speaking with, with the audience on Instagram or social media, but also having this digital database that everyone, anyone can access. Um, and then to be able to physically kind of grapple with the material, you must come to Oslo. So it's also this kind of link, link there. Um, but I think it's a great possibility to have this, this new, like neutrality. Um, there's no kind of, you know, the industry is not set in stone or the scene is not set in stone. And that's, that's very exciting. And luckily also with the library, we have a lot of international guests coming and traveling to us and visiting us. And, and um, so at a very, yeah, privileged place. Yes. Um, I think that with the library we don't have, like our principle is that we don't collect fashion, so garments or kind of um, clothing, and that's, we're quite, you know, rigid with that. We have one t-shirt in the collection, but that's a Vivian Westwood press release that was printed on a collect on a t-shirt, so the function as a garment is kind of secondary, but first and foremost it's a, it's a communication, um, communication tool. Um, I think that with the library, um, the exciting part is having a lot of people coming in and intervening with the, with, the, um, with the collection. And it kind of feels like the library is nothing without the bodies that it touches or the objects are nothing without the bodies it touches. And that's the kind of the magic that happens in the space. Um, and in that way, you know, the project wouldn't have been the same if it opened during COVID, I think. Um, or maybe it would have been after all, but I think this kind of this physical touch and this kind of human element and this um, conversational part of the project is very important. I don't know if I if I answered the, the the question so much, but also in terms of like the educational sides and and um, many of the of the themes that I also tackled in Wallet, we're trying to tackle and expand on with the library. Um, we have a lot of educational partners on the library, but we are not an academic institution and we don't intend to be. But there's also, I mean, we do have, for example, um, a partnership with the National Academy of the Arts in, in Oslo, which is one of many fashion schools or fashion um, courses or offers. But it was, it's very important that, it's, that we're not just linked to one institution. It needs to be a kind of multitude of institutions and various kinds of students, whether that is, in public, whether they're enrolled in public school or private school or in the communication side or the uh, art direction side or the design side. 
yeah, I, c I could go on forever about, about these things. Um, I think that's also something we're thinking a lot about, and I also don't have the answer. Um, but a lot of, I mean, our collection is not really unique. I mean, there are a lot of similar collections in the world, but they're either, or what we find is that they're placed within academic institutions, so only students or researcher or academic researchers can access the collection, or it's kind of, how do you call it, like a, um, subordinate or like a, a smaller part of a costume collection. So if you look at, for example, the, the, the Costume Institute in New York at the Metropolitan Museum or their sister institution that is in Kyoto, it is kind of the clothing and the costume that comes first and then they're relying on their kind of library or archive or ephemera collection to kind of um, like, like yeah, build on it or like support it in a way. Um, and for us, that's also something that we were, that's the reason why we wanted to kind of do this as an, as an, open, an open resource that was first and foremost looking at, you know, how, how fashion is communicated or mediated or uh, interpreted through the printed pages. Um, and maybe someday, you know, we will have more space and we can collect other sides of fashion. Um, this, this spring we're also going um, to Greece to this um, beautiful institution called Atopos, which I really encourage everyone to look up. Um, and they have a collection of paper garments. So they have, you know, um, a wedding gown by Isimiyake that's made in, in paper, for example. Or Craig Dean, um, Craig Green, who's also a... a was trained in London too, who also worked a lot with paper. So then you have suddenly like a conceptual kind of point of departure for doing something that is merging both the costume and the printed matter. So maybe something will happen out of that. I mean, it's a residency, we'll stay for I think three or four weeks. So I think just incubating and, and thinking about it will be super exciting. Yeah, yes. Um, I am working on a new publishing project um, and which was which also will be kind of um, it will most definitely be a fashion magazine and I don't feel like because wallet was so kind of text heavy I've been really intrigued with the kind of the space of image making in fashion so there is a project kind of coming up I don't know when we need to kind of have like the, the structure ready. We've been thinking about it for a couple of years, but um, you know, it's quite costly to produce and you know, my capacity is really now with the library. So doing other projects is a little bit hard. Um, we are housed still in the building that we were dedicated or that, that the National Museum dedicated to us, which is a, a smaller, um, it's actually this, this the station master's building, the station agent's building, um, in this kind of um, discontinued um, westbound train station in Oslo. So it's a really beautiful little building from um, the 1800s. Um, but we are still independent. We're not as part of the National Museum. We're not funded by them directly. We do get uh, like a little bit of a collaborative budget, but. It also means that the team has been working pro bono for, on this for four years, and I think that's the priority now, like creating a more inst like sustainable framework for us to continue to grow this collection and to continue to sustain it. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think this magazine project is, go is going to be super exciting, but I also need to find out how that can fuel into the library somehow, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I'll, I'll keep you posted. Yes. Uh, one more time. Yes. Um, I don't. I, well, it's. I think that for Wallet, it was when we started. When we started the project, um, we had the themes, the ten themes, kind of outlined already. So I think we were just working on that and. There's also something about a limited duration making you put all your energy and all your kind of resources into the 10 issues and making it as good as it can be. Um, if that makes sense, it's all, it was also, with reasons it was, you know, it, I was always, um, or it was a conscious decision to kind of end the publication when I turned 18. But I also did issue an open call for someone to potentially um, take it over, to take the project over. Um, and we did actually get a lot of people who were interested, but it was um, people who were e either like older than I was when I resigned, so it would make sense. You know, the idea was also for a younger person or a younger, it could also be like a younger collective of people taking it over or um, someone who would, you know, take it from a printed magazine to a video platform for all that I cared. I mean, I wanted to pass on the project, but we, you know, one thing was that um, the people who, who reached out to us were either older or it was companies who wanted to kind of buy the concept, which we weren't interested in, um, to kind of sell it, like sell the publication as a brand, but that would make sense. Uh, on the other side, I will also say from like a personal point of view, I mean, I know how much I kind of sacrificed as being a young person running this project and if I wasn't able to like I could pass on the project but then I would have liked there to be a kind of you know a, a payment or something laid to the grounds that this could actually be an operating and functional space to work within because I think that there's a lot of responsibility to pass this on to another 14 year old you know I, I don't think I could necessarily do it I mean creatively I would be very interested in it but on a personal point point of view I would it would hurt me a little bit I think I would feel a bit guilty but yeah with with wallet it was different it was the, the ten the ten themes and we were even thinking that with wallet those ten themes could also be applied to other industries such as the food industry or the art world or the music business you know all of these same themes are quite universal so maybe one day we could do that. It's quite open-ended. Thanks. Yes. Hi, Hi. Thanks. Um, I, I've got a question really, which is, when, when, how old did you say when you started? Yeah, I, reasons I, I found it when I was 13. Yeah. What, what pulled you towards fashion at that age and what pulled you towards it now? Is that different? Is it just really <coughs> Um, well, I grew up in the suburbs. Um, my parents both work in the postal service, so I don't come from any kind of cultural background, background or anything like that. Um, I was always really interested in, in dressing up, and um, I think my first kind of interaction with like dr dressing as identity, as in like a, a marker of identity or something playful or artistic was when I would uh, go to flea markets or, you know, secondhand stores and, and stuff like that. But also, as I said, you know, through fashion magazines. Because um, I think it was something so beautiful about being led into the fashion universe or the fashion space without having to, like, buy into it in a way or to, to um, wear those designer brands or, you know, which I couldn't obviously afford at 13. Um, so I guess it was also like image making, and that's also why I find it intriguing to return to that space also. Fashion image making and uh, also show studio, fashion film. You know, very, very exciting. Um, and it's still active, 
fashion, I mean show studio and there's so much information and content out there to be explored. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I, um, I still think it's really exciting to dress up and and but you know fashion and fashion as in kind of te like garments and clothing isn't really like that my stance on it still like I really you know um, I'm excited by fashion the fashion industry as as the third largest industry in the world mm -hmm. and what that means and the kind of um, social and political dimensions of it. Um, I'm still very frustrated with the fashion, the kind of fashion apparatus or the fashion machinery. And there's a lot of things that I would change with it. And, um, but I think that the library is, is also a kind of, how do I say it, like more of a meditative space. It, it, and that's also the reason why it's important that it is based in a place that is not that doesn't have a big fashion week that doesn't that is not part of the apparatus because I think it's too too fast paced and um, too over the top and too too little accessible and um, yeah many other things but it does feel different and and I feel very privileged to be part of the industry and also to be able to not be part of the industry if I want to, to also kind of exit it. Yeah. Yes, one more question, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question um, that also is very relevant for the library as well. I mean, um, sort of the legal rights in fashion is a very complex and very complicated space to navigate. Um, with publishing archival images, we would either buy it and get the publishing rights through like Getty Images and like image banks, um, or we would reach out to communication teams at the various houses. Um, because Wallet wasn't submission based in that way, so we would actively reach out. Um, and that's, I th that I think is also kind of a good last point to make, which is that I didn't come from the fashion scene or the fashion background and the, the, the network that I've obtained in the fashion industry purely comes from being like not afraid to reach out to people and to people who are supposed to in this kind of hierarchy supposed to be very powerful and kind of untouchable. Um, and I think that this kind of anti-authoritarian um, look at it has been my biggest strength. And also, I mean, we can also call it naivety. <laughs> I've, I've been a child reaching out to, you know, big fashion houses. Adrian Joffrey, when I wanted to interview him, I found his personal Mac.com email and I just reached out and I just kept like following up and I called the Comme des Garçons headquarters because their phones are, you know, in the magazine, in the back pages of the magazines and so on. And he still didn't reach out, uh, he still didn't get back to me. But then I went to New York when I was visiting the collection of Stephen. And then I tapped him on the shoulder. He was there at Dover Street Market. And I said, you have not responded to my email. I want to interview you for this, this new thing that I'm doing wallet. And then he said, well, yeah, you can come to Paris and, and interview me. Um, so I think that's been really a that's that's a great advice really to just not be afraid to like email people call people um when we are kind of younger you can also be a little bit more frank and you can you can you're excused from a lot of these kind of codes or etiquettes um that maybe applies to other people older people more established people um so yeah, but also in terms of the legal rights with the library too, I mean, the digital database is just photos of the front and the back and one inside page of each object, um, but we are not able to fully digitize each object as PDFs or similar. I mean, it would be a huge, a huge undertaking. Um, 
Yeah, it's an, exci it's an exciting space though, what you can do and what you can't do and what is art and what is publishing and what do you monetize of and not, etc. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I will stick around for a bit after in case there's any more questions that we can do one to one. And then I will leave this box here. I have to bring it home because it's the only one that I have, but I'll leave it here for a bit and I'll be back for the workshop or the, the sessions tomorrow also. Thanks for having me. Thank you.